Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the Council of UC Staff Assembly's Winter Quarter Staff Town Hall. My name is Jen Bowser, and I am currently serving as the Council's Operations Officer. My home campus is UC Santa Barbara, where I work in procurement as the Sustainable Procurement Program Manager and Small Business Officer. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to today's Town Hall. Uh, Cooks's chair, Dennis MacGyver, is currently trying to, to join us, and hopefully we, he can connect to audio soon. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce my co-host for the moment, Cooks's immediate past chair, Crystal Petrini. Crystal? Hello, everyone. Um, I'll start us today with the land acknowledgement. The Council of UC Staff Assemblies recognizes that our service occurs on the unceded territory of the Indigenous Peoples of California, and that these lands were and continue to be of great importance to them. Every member of our community has and continues to benefit from the use and stewardship of these lands. With respect and gratitude, we acknowledge and make visible our relationship to the original caretakers. And for more information, you can always visit those websites there. And today is International Women's Day, March 8th. It's an opportunity for us to celebrate women's achievement, raise awareness about discrimination, and take action to drive gender parity. May we acknowledge Women's History Month and the great achievements women have made, not just today, but each and every day. To all of the women here today, I wish you a day filled with strength, power, and courage that makes you the amazing women you are. And with that, we'll go to today's agenda. So we'll begin with um, updates from the delegation, regions highlights, presentations from our CUXA work groups. Um, then we'll have some time for Q&A and we'll showcase upcoming events before closing. And with that, Jen, would you like to start our delegation updates? Jen, you mute it. Yeah, me and the mute button are not friends today. I hover over it and it does nothing. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> uh, since our last town hall in December, Cooksa has hosted two Cooksa chats. The first was a system-wide check-in with Cooksa Chair Dennis MacGyver, Staff Advisor to the Regions Priya Lacaretti, and Michael Austin, the Chair of the UC Administrative Management Professionals. Each event is available for viewing on our YouTube page, and we'll put that link in the chat. And last week, the Cooksa delegation met at UC Merced for our quarterly two and a half day meeting. And we had the opportunity to meet with Leela Davis, who you see here standing in the photo on the left, Associate Vice Chancellor and, Human, and Chief Human Resources Officer. We also got to meet with UC Merced Chancellor Juan Menunos, which is, who is here, Menunos, who's here on the right. Uh, and then the UC staff advisor to the regions in UC Merced uh, staff, Priya Lacaretti. Keith Ellis, who's the UC alumni regent designee and is also a UC Merced alum. Nathan Brostrom, Nathan Brostrom, UC executive vice president and chief financial officer. And we were also very fortunate to have several um, staff and leadership join us from uh, UCOP uh, HR that were in attendance. And the next update we have for you is from the regents. So on Thursday, January 19th, Cooksa Chair Dennis MacGyver had provided remarks to the UC regents during their meeting at UCLA. Dennis emphasized how UC's success in teaching, research, and service is intricately linked to how well staff can do their jobs. And that for every student comforted, faculty supported, and initiative completed, Countless policy covered staff members provide unseen but essential support. He focused on the retention crisis UC is facing that risks the, the quality of teaching, research, and service across UC, and that it is urgent that we view this as the threat that it really is. Dennis' video remarks can be found on our Cooksa YouTube page, and again, we'll put that link in the chat for you shortly. Uh, and the next uh, Regents meeting is actually next week. It's next Wednesday and Thursday at UC Fran San Francisco. And we encourage you to review the meeting agenda and also tune into public comment at 8.30 a.m. on both days. And now I'll turn it over to Dennis for the work group presentations. 
Thank you very much, Jen, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm pleased and delighted to be able to turn this over to our work groups who have been focusing on retention primarily, as well as the KUXA strategic plan. So I'd like to acknowledge Jeremy Brooks, as well as Nathan McCall, Shira Minard, and Jeremy Thacker, who have been leading this very important work. And if we can go to the next slide, we will go ahead and pass it over to our first set of work group updates. All right. Thank you so much, Dennis. My name is Jeremy, the other Jeremy, affectionately known as. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I work at UC Berkeley in the Career Center, working with students interested in social impact and education careers, and I am the work group chair for retention through advancement. So today I'm just going to talk briefly about basically our charge, progress so far, and action items on focusing on advancement opportunities for staff. So um, we have Lovely six people I work with, Erica White, Agam Patel, Lucine Teresian, uh, Andrea Gracer, Nelly Lopez, and Jeremy Brooks. Sorry if I mispronounce anyone's name. And the charge that we were given, really big picture, as you see on the slide, was just how can our current advancement infrastructure be refined and enhanced to help retain UC staff. So we've been looking at what already exists in terms of advancement resources, maybe what's missing, missing some gaps, as well as trying to start and continue some conversations with system-wide and campus leadership on how we can basically just make advancement opportunities more plentiful and really enhance them at our different campuses. So uh, the only other thing, and then we can go to the next slide, I was going to say for Project Scope, um, we did review, there was a CORA report, um, uh, just kind of like on staff retention that came out in 2021 from the UC Coral-wide Southern, uh, Southern cohort. And so we did review that report and that had recommendations already on advancement. So we used a lot of that report's recommendations to hone in on a few um, to really kind of guide our work and identify areas of focus. So I was going to add that here, there. Yeah, first progress so far. Thanks for bringing up that slide. Um, we have prioritized meeting with the different CHROs, the different campuses, and just campus leaders in general, we came up with the template agenda for meeting with the CHROs that was specifically focused on um, advancement, like asking about like what's being done for advancement at the individual campus level and asking the CHROs to please highlight what they're most proud of in terms of advancement that's happening. Um, so an example of this, like at my campus at Berkeley, we have something called the NOW Conference, which is technically open across the UC system. Um, you can contribute to that's kind of like our big end of the year advancement um, event but we're trying to learn more of these things directly from the chros what's happening what you have planned to happen and we know obviously that talking to chros to talk to the managers and their managers that they work with to incentivize them and to incentivize their staff towards advancement is important too so just like really working on these relationships another aspect we focused on is finding and promoting existing resources so they're there are some things already out there that exist. There are talent management courses, people management series and certificates, and these are UC-wide. Um, Lucine, one of our members, is working on putting together a whole list of just system-wide resources that we can share with one another. Things like the UC Management Skills Assessment Program, the UC Women's Initiative for Professional Development, very timely on today, International Women's Day. Um, and we're also going to be meeting with Terry Barton, my work group on March 28th, who is the director of system-wide career and development programs to talk more about what already exists and how KUXA can partner in promoting those resources. Um, we've also compiled lists of career coaching and mentorship programs that exist across the different UC locations to really start sharing best practices and what's working well, what's not working well, for example, it seems like most programs, or sorry, most campuses have a mentorship program of some sort, but recruiting mentors seems to be a challenge across multiple locations. So how can we support one another? Because we know mentorship is so crucial, and we really want to support these programs in basically making more of an incentive for mentors, um, recruiting them, retaining them, um, and just elevating these programs as they exist and sharing best practices. Um, finally, uh, a couple of things we're doing are just putting together examples of reclassification and career pathways. There are a few, but we like to expand them. And usually they're in slightly more niche areas within our systems. And so kind of looking at what already exists in terms of career pathways, there are the career tracks, right, that exist for the different campuses that you can look through and see. But 
it's not always very specific as a lot of us know in terms of moving forward on your career and advancement. Sometimes people feel like they're stuck in their position. So again, how do we alleviate this problem by actually trying to create and make it explicit with opportunities for staff to see how they can actually advance in the organization? So let's look at what already exists and how to create more of these. And finally, really just putting together recommendations based on our findings in these different areas and maybe areas we're not covering of what we think UC, why UC leadership can do and the individual campuses can do. And then the last slide. Doo -doo. Thank you. So the things that we're continuing to do until our work group adjourns, I believe at the end of June, is just keep investigating the areas that we focused on to this point, the areas I just covered, relationships with the Crows, CHRO, sorry, <laughs> promoting existing resources, mentorship, career coaching, and career pathways. We know this; these aren't all the areas within advancement, but these are the ones we chose to focus on for this year. We are just starting a draft of a final report, um, and we're open to feedback on uh, areas of focus that maybe we've missed that should be included, because I'm aware that I'm sure there are. Um, but this essentially would be shared system-wide with UC system-wide leadership on areas for advancement that we think we can improve on, things that are working well, best practices, that sort of thing. Um, within those, obviously, that, that report will have specific recommendations. Specifically, we'll try to compile and centralize some resources. We would like UCOP to be more involved in setting the standard for best practices and advancement. A lot of times we're hearing sometimes that it is uh, incumbent on the CHRO of that location, right, to really dictate maybe how sometimes resources or priorities are shared. So just having a more of a unifying voice, and I know this is common through a lot of issues across the UC system. And we want to continue meeting with system-wide leaders. So I actually do need to follow up with you, Dennis, and maybe some people on this call about setting up more meetings. So besides Terry, just continue to meet with folks like Missy, Sue Anderson, that are really in charge of kind of helping with a lot of these initiatives. So that is where our work group is at. So I believe I will now pass it to Nathan. I'm happy to jump in. Um, do I need to make room for questions? For Jeremy specifically, or are we doing a group Q and A at the end, Dennis? Let's do a cute group Q and A, and so you're up. Sounds good. Well, that was a lot of information, Jeremy. Everybody, take a deep breath, <laughs> and then here comes a lot more information. All right. So uh, my name is Nathan McCall. I serve as the HR Business Information Services Manager at Santa Cruz. I do have a history of working in the compensation unit there. Brief though it was, it was very informative. Um, and I'm currently serving as the past chair of our local staff assembly, and this is my second year as Cooks delegate. Uh, so in reviewing all of the, um, as Jeremy mentioned, same thing, all three of the work groups were given lots of information to review ahead of time um, so that we weren't just trying to invent things from scratch. No need to reinvent the wheel, but let's see if we can use the wheel that exists better. Um, so in reviewing all the Coro, Cooks, and other work that was provided to us, we were affirmed in our initial hunch that convert, uh, compensation is a very long arc conversation. And so our goal is to make a dent in that conversation. And who is our? Our are the folks listed on the screen. Uh, myself, Erica Leone, Anna Esquivel, uh, Nicola Grun, and Teresa Short. I really like um, that it's folks from all over and even different types of locations. For example, we've got a lab, office of the president, and then a few campuses in there. It's really Nice to be able to see the, the breadth within one little one little tiny group. So small but mighty. Here we go. Next slide. So that, like I mentioned, is what we're trying to do. We are trying to raise awareness. That is the goal of this first year because we know that we are um, providing the groundwork for that long arc conversation, a solid foundation off of which to bridge to get from here to there. And if I can instill in one more word picture, we're going to be standing on the ground or at least on the shoulder of other people's work, um, reaching as high as we can to put a dent in the wall above our head so that the next year's people can climb up and put a toe in that dent and then keep climbing and then keep climbing. That's the goal of what we're trying to do. So we're not trying to change the world this year. We're trying to lay good foundations. And the way that we'll do that is by raising awareness at uh, different levels or key levels in our uh, system-wide organization. And that's at the staff assembly level, the regental and office of the president level, and then at the Kooks a delegate level. And so let's talk about how we're gonna do those three and what we've already been doing. So this is how we arrange these slides. We talked about what has been done and what we're aiming to do for each of those three key areas of awareness. So at the staff assembly level, uh, we created a total compensation matrix um, 
which shows all the different types of benefits at the campuses. And it shows where some campuses have certain benefits and other campuses don't. Um, that way, local staff assemblies can say, hey, uh, Berkeley's got this cool thing and we don't. Let's talk to Berkeley of how we can get it. Or Merced's got this really cool thing that we don't. Let's talk to Merced and see how we can get it. So um, that's completed. And then which of those actually have to do with total compensation? And within total compensation, there's the monetary compensation and then the non-monetary compensation. So we looked at best practices across, you know, nationwide, really, of a, a lot of different folks of how they uh, define total compensation, those two aspects of it, monetary, non-monetary. And we just landed on the um, UCOP total compensation estimator definitions. Um, and that's going to then allow us to really focus in on the money and the not money, even though, excuse me, the monetary and the non-monetary, even though the non-monetary often comes with a money component to it. But we wanted to make sure to speak the same language that Office of the President is speaking, so that any recommendations we do make, they'll already be able to assimilate it very quickly without having to learn our definitions. Of all of the benefits listed in the total compensation matrix, we focused on two areas to do a deep dive. One is tuition remission, and the other is housing assistance for staff specifically. Um, on, in, in the area of tuition remission, you can see John Bodenschatz, and who is a current chair elect of CUCSA, um, and the staff advisor to the regents, Joe Magnus, have been invited into a system-wide HR conversation about this very topic. That's great progress. Um, because it's with Joe, we're assuming it's not actually going to start until next year, <laughs> because she'll become the staff advisor to the regent in, in the next academic year, not this year. But that's really great progress. Um, not only is the conversation happening, but we have a seat at the table. Dare I say we have two seats at the table. So that's really good news. Um, the housing assistance for staff, we created questionnaires to send out to UC locations. We're going to, and now we're into the what are we aiming to do? We're going to compile all that data that we get from those surveys and then um, see if that is, tells a compelling story and if it would be aided by, and if we have time to reach out to our comparator organizations like MIT, Stanford, Illinois, you know, certain private and public universities that the UC compares itself to. Again, using the UC definitions of who UC says we compare to, that way they don't have to question whether or not it's a legitimate comparison. Also, we'll continue to refine the matrix so that it's truly a helpful tool, tool that is worthy of being kept up over the years because we want that staff assembly um, benefits to be there. Next slide, please, where we talk about the awareness for the regents and the UCOP. So the goal here is to create a lookup tool similar to the title code system uh, inquiry lookup tool, where you can look at any campus, the uh, classification, and see the pay grades that are associated with that. But what if we also had right next to that in the column to the left is the cost of labor in that area, and then the cost of living, perhaps, um, it's less relevant, but still might be useful. And if we had all that information available and in, in play, then it'd be very easy for people to start their public comment with a statement like, my name is Nathan McCall, my classification is blah, 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 and I'm compensated at X percent of the cost of labor in my area. And today I'd like to talk about paid parental leave or free parking or let's go to the moon or whatever. Um, but if everybody starts saying their... Um, where they sit in the cost of labor percentage, um, that's going to start pinging over and over again the regental awareness of, wait a minute, why are all of our people at the 83rd uh, percent? Or why are they only at 72 percent? Or why are those, you know, that, that's the idea of raising awareness. So without lecturing to them, we're just going to ping them every single public comment. Um, this will be a tool that will be available for folks. Of course, we can't compel people to use that in their public comment, but it's still going to be available. Um, and then, of course, they can go and look up the data themselves. Uh, next slide for the uh, CUCSA. So what has been done there is, oh, actually, can we go back? I forgot a really important piece. Um, what, uh, the two ideas were, let's piggyback on the current title code system tool, or if Office of the President doesn't want to have us put our data into their system, then we'll create our own tool for people to look it up. What we learned was there is a plan in place to revamp and modernize the title code system. And so that's actually a really great moment to step in and say, hey, can we add these pieces of information? Again, if we still don't get the green light for joining them during their modernization effort, then we can move on to creating our own tool, but better to play well with others 
and put all the data in one place, if at all possible. So we're pursuing that, that option. Okay, thank you for uh, moving to the next slide now for the KUXA. So the point here was to find out how much our current employees actually value the different benefits that we're currently offering. So we know where to press and where to press further or where to maybe ease off a bit because we don't think it's that important, we the collective we. Um, so we had intended to create a survey uh, upon speaking with system-wide HR folks. They said they were already gonna create a survey. And so again, play well with others. Uh, since that one wasn't as urgent or pressing, we decided to wait for that um, effort to move forward. And that is going to be happening next year. Um, so we will be able to provide an update in September as to how that process is going, um, whether we were invited in to form the questions or simply to review the questions. And if we can go to the last slide, I believe it's the last slide. There we go. This is just a summary. Again, we're trying to make a dent in the huge body of work to try to help the next people because one of the things I really enjoy is this work group is intended to last not only this year, but also into next year and perhaps beyond in order to continue that work because compensation is at the forefront of most people's minds. Um, and so this is important work we're, we're leading to. So everything's in progress except for that survey. You can see it's been deferred to fiscal year 24. And I will say one last thing, and that is we're not just doing this. We're constantly hunting for ways to propel the conversation or to, to um, find a way into the awareness. For example, at the Merced visit, the quarterly meeting um, that Kuxa had last week, we were able to speak with Nathan Broadstrom and we were able to ask questions that are going to be informing next week's public comment that we'll be making at the Regents meeting. So we're constantly asking system-wide leadership, what do you think about this idea? How can we move this forward? And getting their feedback so that we can formulate the public comment or ask better questions and then insert that into the regental awareness. And with that, I think my slides are over and I'll say thanks for listening to that fire hose. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, my name is Shira Minard. I'm the Work-Life Resource Coordinator from UC Santa Barbara and the second year delegate, as well as the um, work group chair for retention, wellness, and the staff experience. Um, my incredible cohort of um, work group of folks are Courtney Klein from Berkeley, Desiree Hennen from San Diego, Greta Carlele from Santa Barbara, um, Kaylee Hayakawa from Irvine, myself, uh, Vanity Campbell from Ag and Natural Resources. So um, couldn't have done this without um, all of their work. So I just wanted to highlight them. Um, our charge this year is to create a framework for addressing employee retention through the lens of wellness and the staff experience and further charged with identifying local and system-wide resources for employees as well as for supervisors to use. Um, just as a, a brief content note, um, we have summarized our presentation, but it will highlight some mental health concerns. Um, next slide. So presently employee retention has proven challenging for both public and private employers alike. And UC system-wide, as we know, has more than 5,000 vacancies with serious implications for the UC, as of course it Im impacts productivity levels, employee engagement, and the overarching uh, psychological well-being of our community. So as an evidence-based approach to organizations that focus on worker well-being report higher productivity and retention rates. And the vision is really that the UC is the workplace of choice for Californians and the nation prioritizing equitable workforce engagement and an organizational culture that positions all employees to thrive towards a more resilient, diverse, and competitive California through the UC workforce and the university's combined missions of teaching, research, and public service, that California will exceed its standing as the fifth largest gross domestic product in the world. Next slide. So looking at this overall charge and knowing the sheer breadth of, uh, of our assigned scope, we started to meet in August. Um, we reviewed the previous KUXA Wellness Committee reports, of course, read the best practice research from uh, around and throughout higher education, including the Okanagan Charter for, public, uh, for Health Promoting Universities and Colleges. We met with the Healthy Campus Network in September with wellness coordinators and managers across the UC in October. 
and reviewed the president's priorities as well as the U U.S. Surgeon General's report, the CDC's NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, and the World Health Organization. And we collected impact survey testimonials, and we've received um, over 270 responses system-wide thus far. Next slide. So um, we went back and looked uh, to 2015, and you may have seen um, the, the graph in the upper right corner before uh, we presented this in, in the fall as well. Um, in 2015, the UC agreed to increase student enrollment, and as student numbers grew, faculty growth was a focus. Staff numbers did not, PSS staff numbers did not grow at that same pace. So this resulted in an inadequate staff numbers prior to the pandemic, and there was pride in campuses being able to continue to function with lean staff numbers. So many staff were willing to go the extra mile because they believe in the mission of the university and we want to support students and faculty. However, the impact of the pandemic and the great resignation, um, as we know, has resulted in significant staff vacancies um, that were it, it expanded on the impact that was we were already seeing. Um, and campuses are struggling still to fill those positions. So since 2016, student growth has been about 10.7%, faculty growth 11.43%, while PSS staff decreased by 0.73%. The staff that are remaining are struggling to keep up with the workload, and burnout has affected their health and well being, compounded with increased cost of living, outpacing salary increases. Staff no longer see a reason to commit extra energy to their jobs. And so in the impact surveys that we've been collecting, and you can see um, on the screen here, we see a theme that, that you all are saying that you want to do a good job in the job that you were hired to do, but you can't because you're spread too thin. Next slide. So how do we move the needle towards being that workplace of choice? Um, through all of those conversations and the, the research that we've been conducting, um, we came up with six, six recommendations. Um, we first want to focus on changing the message on overwork, right? We can't do more with less. We can't be lean and mean. Um, someone joked, I think it was uh, maybe one of the HR leaders, right? We, it, lean and mean it means that we're just mean, <laughs> essentially. So we can't, we can't, uh, we need to, we need to change that message. Um, we want to increase our hiring goals so that we see uh, hiring goals on par with student and faculty growth, that there is evidence-based training guidelines and recommendations for managers and supervisors um, to increase employee well-being uh, and encourage participation in those uh, well-being activities on our campuses. Encourage managers, campus, and university leadership to really model that wellness, those wellness practices. Um, if we, if the managers and supervisors and, and campus leadership um, aren't participating, or if they're working through lunch, et cetera, then it's it's harder for employees to to choose to do that on their own. We'd also like to recommend a chief wellness officer to report directly to President Drake, who would advocate for the wellness of university employees and manage a system-wide platform for employee well-being. We'd also like to streamline and grow the healthy department certification process and the wellness ambassador program. Next slide. So um, as far as our next steps go, we'll be presenting to the wellness managers for their feedback uh, in um, a more full and um, structured way on March 21st. We'll be sharing the overwork impact statements that we've co collected and we have extended the closing deadline to March 15th. So if you have been thinking about it and you'd like to still submit, we'll put the link in the chat and then we'll be finalizing recommendations for our final report in June. And thank you all so much um, for taking the time to sit with us today. Um, if you want to maybe just take a quick stress break uh, and then we'll get to our next slide on the strategic plan. Thank you all. And I guess that's going to be where I tag in to talk about the strategic plan. And I'm Dennis McIver from UC Office of the President, he, him, his pronouns, and Chair of Kuxa. And so I'm here to speak for the strategic plan. And I wanted to acknowledge Jeremy, Ian, Coban, and Lauren, who represent that particular work group. And the major takeaway that they wanted to convey for this point is that 
they have been doing a lot of intentional work when it comes to stakeholders, including local human resources contact, local staff assemblies, the current and past delegation, and to broadly get a sense of what KUXA is, what KUXA sh could be, and what should our goals be. And so that's been what the focus of the energy has been over the last few months. The plan is to ultimately present some updates during our last meeting of the year. And so we just wanted to share broadly, this is where they are now. It's been a lot of deep dive in terms of data acquisition and the goal is to present something a bit more concrete in June. But right now it's just talking to the stakeholders and, and getting some feedback. As long as I had the microphone, I also wanted to acknowledge our internal operations work group as well, led by Jen. And they're doing very important background work, Katie, as well as Veronica, Roberta, Jen. And so generally they are doing some very important measures when it comes to the inner workings of KUXA, everything from government relations to our data and records. And it's unseen, but it's felt every day. So I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that as well. I do see we have a number of different chats that are emerging. So I guess we can go to the next slide. If you have any questions for us, I encourage you to place them into the Q&A section and we will try our best to answer them. Or I'll just make up questions, either way. I have a question actually, Dennis, and it's about the functionality of the Q&A. Um, I do see that Meredith put in a question and I have now answered that question in the Q&A. And I'm curious if um, all the other participants will be, will be able to see not only the question, but also the answer. Yes, once you've answered, it migrates over to the answered section. And so you yes. just be able to see it there. And Perfect. there you go. Thanks. One question we just received is from an alumni delegate who asked, where can we see the slides? I think we can make those available after the presentation. I think we have a listing of participants, so we sh should be able to either share them or we can house them elsewhere, but we'll make sure the word gets out with our, the slides for everyone. Okay, and I see that we also have questions coming from chat as well as from the Q&A section. I will start with the easy one, which is in Q&A, and it's not familiar with KUXA to any significant extent. How do we become involved with KUXA? First of all, thank you, that's, that's fantastic. And I think this is an important start to that. A lot of the engagement can happen through working with your local staff assembly. So I do want to spotlight them. Many of them will be holding their own election cycles over the next couple of weeks to months. So I encourage you to pay attention to your local staff assembly because we share all of our updates and information with them. I also wanted to spotlight that in a couple of weeks, we're going to be holding a actual event about being involved with staff assembly. And of course, Jen is right on it. So I would encourage you to participate in that. That way you can learn more about how to get involved locally. And if you haven't already, I also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter because once a month we share a lot of interesting things system-wide as it relates to staff. I invite anyone else to add any other feedback that I may have missed. Okay, so clearly I named, I nailed it. So, hey, that'll work. <laughs> and I'll be honest, I'm struggling to find the original, the previous question in chat. If someone will be able to read that out, I, that would help me out a bunch. So we do have one question from Fiona asking, what about the four day work week with no cut in pay? The pilot programs in the UK and in Canada have been very positive. Thank you for that question, Fiona. I think what I would say is broadly is that KUXA has very much been in support for work flexibility in every form. The immediate reaction that a lot of folks have to that is, well, remote work. And I do think that's a piece of it. 
but I would consider flex scheduling, four-day work weeks, I would consider all of that to be under the same umbrella. Ultimately, we want to give a level of understanding to staff regardless of where they are because one thing we often hear is not everyone can necessarily work remotely because what if you have more direct service that requires requires you to be in location? Okay, that's fine, but that doesn't mean we can't offer other things such as flex scheduling, third shifts, and we should be looking at and encouraging as much of that as possible. I think that's one of the ideas that we can, we absolutely can and should be looking at for the future because it's all about empowering our staff to engage in the way that they see fit for where they are in life. And then as our next question is from Ross French, he asks, has there been any consideration of speaking with the unions regarding these new staff centric proposals since they will likely impact them as well? And thank you, Ross, for the question. You know, that's always one that's a little bit tricky. And I wanna acknowledge that because of our scope prim primarily centers on policy covered staff. But one one area that I would be interested in is having some broader discussion with our system wide HR office around that. We do have an executive director for labor relations. I'd be very interested in starting some conversations there because while one of the things we say with Kooksa is a lot of our work service is policy covered, but also all staff, but I also want to be kind of mindful of how we traverse that space, <laughs> what some may call the forbidden door even. So so to answer your question, I think it's a possibility. I would just wanna be very mindful of how we approach those conversations. And can I add something, Dennis? Um, and locally, we're trying to do that. Like I know uh, locally at Berkeley, we recently said that to our CHRO, like, hey, we wanna be more in conversation with the unions, like how can we navigate this more? And so we set up a conversation with our CHRO to talk about that. Like how can we be more strategic about at least information sharing and then that sort of thing. So uh, I think some of these conversations are also happening locally too, um, because I know there's interest in that is the one I wanted to validate is like kind of getting a little bit more on the same page, not just being completely in the dark, I would say. But yeah, you have to be careful about how you traverse it. And we have another question from Fiona. Thank you so much for submitting another one. We appreciate it. With regards to workload, many staff feel they can't take vacation. Is it possible to automatically raise the max amount staff can accrue? Fiona's asking um, me hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I mean, I know that they they did that temporarily, right during during the height of the pandemic. Um, but I would push back a little bit um, because, from a wellness perspective, um, when you are feeling the most maxed out and the most like you can't take a vacation is probably when you need it the most, um, and and when you should. So the question then becomes um, encouraging managers and supervisors to make sure that that is happening for their employees, that they are taking their breaks and their vacations so that you can recharge and come back to the university um, fresh and, and reset. I mean, I know it's hard to come back to a thousand emails in your inbox and, and workload, et cetera, but it really does taking that time to step away, uh, then, then, um, then you're not uh, recharging. Um, the real the uh, Harumi pointed out the reality is that it just makes folks lose vacation. So, um, you know, again, I think that's um, really needs to be where the where the focus is. So either you are going to up their vacation time, or you're going to ensure that they are taking their vacation. Um, and from a wellness perspective, uh, I would say it's better to make sure that your employees are taking their vacations. I would just add to, and, and thank you so much for that, Shira. I think you articulated that point really, really well. To me, it speaks to some of the issues of the culture, and these are some of the tail end effects that we see of understaffing, which I think underscores a lot of the problems that we're facing. And I, so I think it all kind of works together in a really tragic and weird sort of way. But the bottom, one of the bottom lines to me is that the culture is not enabling folks to get the breaks that they reserve, and that's a, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. But 
So yeah, I think broadly though, we need to be at a better place where folks can take a, a breather from, from their jobs and be able to recover it. Because ultimately I find that folks pay for this one way or the other, right? And so I, I think so much of this relates to shifting the culture. And unfortunately that's one of the things that just takes time, but at least we're seeing a lot more awareness of it. And so it's, it's a start, but I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we're talking about in the in the wellness work group is if you're not taking your breaks, if you're not taking your vacation, eventually you're going to go out on stress leave, right? Or or uh, have a health concern or problems that way when you're overworked. So um, take your vacations. I just wanted to add to that. Um, yes, take your vacations. I fall into that boat a lot also of feeling like I can't take a day or I can't be gone because I have to save all of my time for my children who are always sick <laughs> because I think anyone whose parent knows that that's happening a lot, especially now. And, you know, also just my workload is incredible, right? And so, but I think to this point is it takes us also pushing back against the expectations that existed previously. And I know I have a lot of conversations with my faculty, with my staff, with people in my dean's office, just about how much work there is and, and reminding them of how much work is happening so that they don't expect things in an unreasonable amount of time. And you are not replaceable in your home, in your life. And so to all of these things, it's very important that you make sure you take care of yourself fully and your health. And, and yes, work is important, but most of us have jobs where the work will be there, even if we're gone for a day or a week or something else. And I think it's just a matter of reminding ourselves of that because we're usually the folks that want to do the extra work and don't want to be missing and all of that, but we have to make sure we're taking care of ourselves and our health first. And in the event that, you know, you are getting to your max and you don't have like the time literally, you know, to take it before you're maxed out. A lot of campuses also have um, chaotic or what is it called? Um, emergency yeah, catastrophic. catastrophic there we go thank you not chaotic that's just a normal day right catastrophic leave um a lot of campuses have programs where you can actually donate your vacation time to a fund within hr so that if folks are going through some sort of catastrophe they have access to additional time if if they don't have the time themselves which happens a lot to like our hourly um staff on our campuses so i just wanted to add those couple of things Great, thank you for that, Crystal. And we have time for one more question. And from Q&A, the question was, will there be any additional medical plans offered for those who work remotely? I don't think that falls into the scope of what we've color covered for this year, but I am curious about what you've mentioned. I'm gonna give you my email address. If you have examples that we should be considering looking at for the future, then I welcome you, you to send that over to us. So. I'll send you my email address and please feel free to send any resource or information you have my way because I, I would be interested in looking more into what you've mentioned. Or Jenkin, thank you, Jen. <laughs> send me that or cat memes, please. Okay, so thank you all very much for a really enjoyable conversation session. As we mentioned, we do have a couple of different things coming up over the next few months that I wanted to share. The first one will be on March 28th, and that's going to tell you more about getting involved with your local staff assembly. We've asked participants at the different staff assemblies to talk about what they are up to, what the election cycle looks like. And so that's going to happen in a couple of weeks, and we encourage you to join us for that. The links have been placed into chat. And then the following month, in response to the Black Staff Leadership Panel that we had in February, we're now going to have a Latinx Staff Leadership Panel. And we have a really exciting panel. I'm going to give one name to you. They're in there. She's in the room now, Crystal Petrini. So shout out. But it'll be a good conversation just about the leadership experience for being a member of the Latinx community. And I'm very excited to be able to host that. I have to give y'all something to look else to look forward to so you'll see the other names soon but please be sure to register please be sure to spread the word we really do appreciate it and if you're interested in all of the cool stuff that kook says up to i encourage you to stay connected with us through our newsletter through all the different social media outputs we have this will be recorded i encourage you to share it with people you think may be interested and if you think we're doing great or if you think there's something that we need to know about send it our way too we welcome that feedback and we appreciate you taking the time to give us 51 minutes of your lunch hour. 
I'm going to be quiet. Wish you a happy rest of the week. Thank you to our work group chairs, to Crystal Engine for their work, and thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of the day.